All right, guys, welcome to week 11 review. On this one, we will be covering modules 63 to 66 and mostly covering price discrimination. So finishing up monopolies, but also working on how oligopolies work together. Uh, work. So let's go ahead and get started. Already pulled the class on the questions that they want answered and let's go. The first one we'll be covering is number six. So number six says, which of the following are examples of volume discounting forms of price discrimination? Volume discount is pretty rare. It's not something that's like super crucial in class, but essentially it's when you buy in bulk, I'll discount how many you buy. So which of these examples are people buying in bulk for a discount? Think of it like when you go to Publix and you buy one soda, like one bottle that's in the fridge there is two bucks. But if you were to buy an eight pack of those exact same bottles, it would be about four. So you're paying $4 for eight or two bucks for one. That's volume discount. So what's the closest example to that? Senior citizen discounts, that's not, has the, that has nothing to do with scale or volume. They just, uh, senior citizens are on a budget, therefore they're just willing to pay less for things. They'll also go to things earlier for that, which means you can go senior citizen discount for the early crowd, the later crowd's more inelastic and they pay more. Discounts for families of young children at motels, no, just children don't destroy you as much. They're a lower cost. Generally lower price at Walmart than Target. Walmart than Target. Well, those are stores that do volume discounts, but it's talking about why is Walmart cheaper than Target? That's competitive price war. Cheaper airfares for traveler stays over Saturday. That is price discrimination, but it has nothing to do with volume. But a lower price per can of soda? Yep, there we go. When a case of 24 sodas is purchased rather than one or two. So when you buy in bulk, they give you a discount as in they're willing to sell you a can of soda for about 35 cents each. But they know if you only want to buy one, you'll probably pay two bucks. But how do I get you to buy a lot at 33 cents? Bulk. So that's all that is. Not a terribly uh, important concept for us to know. But let's move on to nine. Collusive agreements are typically difficult for cartels to maintain because each firm can increase profits by well, not by reporting collusion to the government, they both go to jail, producing less output and quantity that maximizes joint cartel crops. No, cartels tend to reduce production so that the price raises and they can get more profit. Increase the price above the price that maximizes a joint cartel's profits. They can't do that alone. In fact, alone, they can only decrease prices. See, if an uh, oligopolist in a cartel increases production, They'd have to lower the price to sell the extra production they've made. So engage in less advertising, the level of advertising that maximizes joint cartel profits. That probably wouldn't increase profits because less advertising means less demand, but that's a weird one. The real best answer here is producing more output than the quantity that maximizes joint cartel profits. If we both agree to cut our production, so that prices go up, well, great, our profits will go up. But it does mean that with these higher prices, I'd like to produce more at the higher price. So I'd want to cheat. Hence, why are these uh, difficult for cartels to maintain? Because there's this example of people wanting to cheat. A very specific question, not kind of a very good concept-based question as well. So you want to reduce production, but E is producing more? Right. So you and I form cartel, okay? We go ahead and lower our production so that consumers will pay more for our goods and we'll make more profit. Mm. So we both lower our production, but guess what I want to do? Make more so you're going to make more. Yeah. Hey, prices went up. I was willing to make this many at a low price. Now the price is high and I'm making this much. I definitely want to produce more. So I would cheat. Oh, so that's cheating. That's, that's like totally cheating. cheating on it. So what makes collusive agreements hard to maintain? Well, someone wants to cheat. The biggest example of cheating here is producing more output than the agreed upon quantity. Okay. That happens with OPEC. All right, let's hit 11. 11 is a very simple question. So long as you know how to read the question. So the table shows the demand schedule for crude oil. For simplicity, assume the marginal cost of crude oil equals zero. If marginal cost is zero, then their cost of producing is what? Zero. zero. They're a zero cost producer. 
That means their profit is equal to what? As much as labor. So it's like a total revenue. Total revenue. Profit and total revenue equal each other now. So to make more profit, you just maximize revenue. total revenue. Okay, so let's keep going. If the crude oil industry is a monopoly, the price of crude oil will be blank. The total quantity of crude oil produced will be blank. Barrels in the monopoly will earn economic profits equal to blank. Okay, so if you have no costs and you want to maximize profits, you just maximize what? Total revenue. So where's total revenue maximized? Well, we've got our quantity and our price, so we can multiply them to get our total revenues, which they've already done. Ah, so where are profits maximized? Where total revenues maximized. So essentially, find the big number, and you solve the question. The price will be 80, the quantity, I'm sorry, price will be 80, the quantity will be 80, and the total revenue, which is total profit, zero cost monopoly, is going to be 6400 all right let's go ahead and move on to number 13. all right this is a series of questions which is really good for you guys to know that references buffy the vampire slayer you know a classic 90s television show and let's go ahead and just go over this one what we have here is a demand schedule you have at each price in the market all the quantities consumers would buy that's very useful because it helps us calculate what? If I have price and I have the quantity, what can I definitely solve for? Total revenue. Total revenue. In theory, also marginal revenue, but we won't even have to go that far. And I'll show you why. The table shows a man for wooden steaks in the town of Sunnydale. That's where the show took place. Suppose the marginal cost of producing steaks is zero. Wooden steaks, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Get it? All right. For wooden steaks and Spike Co. Now you might say spikes like a wooden steak. No, Spike was one of the main vampire characters in Buffy. And then I'm gonna have her weight chip and I'm falling out. And then he got his own spin-off. All right. So Buffy, main character, they agree to produce only 50 wooden steaks. Okay. With each turn producing only 25. So you say we'll reduce our production, make 25, and we'll go ahead and try to profit maximize. How much profit does each firm earn if they each maintain the agreement? So they make 50 stakes. If I make 50 wooden stakes, I want to know what's the most I can sell them for so I can sell all of the stakes. So what's the price of 50 wooden stakes? 10. Oh, okay. That's actually pretty easy then. So $10 a stake. I made 25. Spike made 25. And we're already solved there because I made 250 bucks, 25 stakes for $10 each. That's my profit because again, we're at a zero cost uh, firm. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to 14. So it's right there. The table shows the demand for wooden stakes in the town of Sunnyvale. So it's the marginal cost of producing stakes at zero. The only two firms producing wooden stakes, Spike and Buffy, agree to make 50 stakes, each make 25. Okay, so we're back to where we were. By how much does Buffy's profit rise if she cheats on the agreement and produces 30 stakes? All right, there's levels to this question. That's what makes it a good one. So Buffy's going to make 50. Spike's going to hold the agreement at 25. How many stakes is that total in the market? 30, 25. That would be 55 stakes. Well, if I want to sell more stakes, I need to do what? Lower the price. So I lower the price. To nine dollars okay but it's set so what will buffy who cheated what will her profit be she made 30 stakes sold them for nine dollars each what's her total revenue uh 270. 270 so 90 times 30 is 270 that's her profit because there's zero cost in this example well it was 250 from the previous question now it's 270 how much more is it the answer is $20. That's good. All right, and let's do 15. All right, the table shows the demand for wooden stakes in town of Sunnyvale. Suppose the margin loss of stakes at zero again. The only two firms producing wooden stakes, like Buffy Co., Greed of Foreign Test Cartel. What price will the cartel charge and how many stakes will the cartel sell? So, how can they maximize profits? Hint, they're a zero cost firm. 
So they just want to do what? Maximize total revenue. By the way, when total revenue is maximized, marginal revenue is? If my total revenue is maximized, how much extra revenue or additional revenue can I get from making one more unit? Zero. So is marginal cost equaling marginal revenue still? The rule still apply. But so we got to find where marginal revenue is zero or total revenue is maximized. So what you got to do here is find the total revenue for each firm and find the one that's the largest. And you can do all the math or you can kind of guess somewhere in the middle and see what happens. So what do you guys think it is? Just take a guess. We've all already done We'll take a guess. <laughs> 50. 50? So let's start at 50. 50 times 10 is 500. Okay, cool. Let's see if we make one more if our total revenue increases and we still need to keep going forward on our math. So nine times 55 is 495. Our total revenue fell. So definitely making more is not gonna maximize our total revenue. But if we go back 11 and 45, our total revenue is well, it's 495, which means can I get any more total revenue if it's already peaked? You might remember that total revenue curve so we're at the top of it. If we go one more, we lose total revenue. If we go back, we lose total revenue. So 10 and 50, which is right there, 10 and 50. Any questions? All right. Let's move on to number 17. Ah, Purple Rain. Man, they're making all the good references this time around. Greaves, no, we're going to do Purple Rain. Is that, is that a prince? Yeah, it's a prince reference. OK. The figure shows the payoff matrix for two producers of bottled water, Blue Spring and Purple Rain. The Nash equilibrium in the figure is reached when? Okay, so let's find the Nash equilibrium. Just kind of, again, we step by step. So what should Purple Rain, of course I gotta make this purple. Um, what should Purple Rain do if Blue Spring charges a high price? Make 20,000 or 50,000? 50,000, have a low price. But if Blue Springs has a low price, what should Purple Rain do? Should they make negative $2,000 or $10,000? $10,000. Okay, does Purple Rain have a dominant strategy? Yes. Yes. They're gonna have low price no matter what. On the other hand, we have Blue Springs, all right? Blue Springs, if Purple Rain is a high price, Blue Springs, should they make 20,000 profit or 50,000 profit? 50. So they should have a low price. And if Purple Rain has a low price, should Blue Springs have negative 2,000 or 10,000 profit? Do they have a dominant strategy? Yes. Blue Springs does. So we end up with our Nash equilibrium being right here. So Nash equilibrium, it says, what is the Nash equilibrium? So the answer is both firms charge a low price because that's both of their dominant strategies. Where would their optimal strategy be to maximize profits? Yeah. Well, the optimal strategy is for both to have a high price at 20000 They would like to cheat. There would be a tit for tat game going on after it, but this is their collusion. So if they ask that. Okay, so if they collude, it's high price because. Because here's 10 10. No one's going to lose, go to the negative 2,000 profit. So no one will go to here uh, 50,000. It's off the table. But I could get someone to go, hey, what if instead of 10,000 profit, we both raise our prices and get 20,000? So they could agree to that. Both are better off. So top left is the cooperative equilibrium? Yeah, top left, that's a cooperative or profit maximizer. Cooperative is collude, right? Yes, they would have to collude to get there. Because if they competed, the non cooperative equilibrium is the Nash equilibrium. Nash equilibrium, definitely the most important one to be able to find. Okay. And now we move on to 27. All right, 27. It has another payoff matrix, but it looks a little different from the ones you guys have been seeing because on this one, they don't have the line in here. And I know you guys are used to the line, but it's fine, you, you don't need the line. But if you want to draw the line in here, you can. We'll go ahead and we'll make it a nice yellow one. And remember I said, you just kind of draw a line like this. 
We know this is Swifty and the second one is Speedy because it literally says it, the payoff matrix are given as Swifty comma Speedy. They even tell you exactly how to draw it out. Now this is where you might wanna come tomorrow to the quiz with like four or five payoff matrices, like empty ones just drawn out. So when I say go, you're like, do, 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 do. and a fair warning, even though it says like blue springs and purple rain, there are different ones with blue springs and purple rain with different numbers in that matrix. So you're like, I'll just use my practice problems. Be careful. The numbers might not be the same. I'm not saying they will be different, but there are different ones in there. So make sure you don't go, I already know what this one is. Look at the numbers first, I promise. Okay, so let's say that if we are, let's say speedy gas, speedy gas is the second one right here. So let's go ahead and just solve for this matrix. So it says two gas in small town. We got Swifty, speedy gas, each firm set a high price and a low price. The customer's view two firms as nearly perfect substitutes. Tell shows payoff matrix, daily profits each firm received from their price decision. Given the price decision of their rival, profits in each shell matrix are given that. Which way to describe the dominant strategy in this game? So let's find out their strategies. All right, so if Swifty does a high price, what will Speedy, the second one, do? Make 100 or 150? Low price. Oh, the low price, very good. What will they do if Swifty has a low price? Make 25 or 50? So what does Speedy have? Speedy dominant. has a low price dominant strategy. On the other hand, let's find the answer for Swifty. If Speedy has a high price, what should Swifty do? Make 100 or 150? 150. And if the low price here is 50, what should we do? Low. Low price. So Swifty has a Dominant strategy two, and the overall strategy of the game for both firms is to do what? Low price. Low price, low price. They both have a dominant strategy. That means they'll do a low price no matter what the other firm does. So if we look at this, Swifty will always set a low price no matter Speedy's choice. Yes, because Swifty has a dominant strategy. But don't both of them? They do, but is that an option? Oh, no. Say so Swifty will always set a high price. No, Swifty will set a low price when Speedy sets a high price. No. Swifty will always have a low price, and Swifty will set a high price when Speedy gets a high price, but Swifty will set a low price and Speedy gets a low price. Speedy gets, nope. Gets low, 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 low. What does it do? Just oh, it, it deals with the Cromulonian paradox. That sometimes you got to get Swifty if you want to survive the game. All right. <laughs> you guys ready to move on? Yeah. I thought that was a joke. Yeah. Mm. I think you like put it in there. Do I yeah. ever joke in these yeah. things? No, but in the back, in the back look. Okay, ready? Um, and 28. 20 says, suppose that each of the two prisoners has the independent choice of confessing to a crime or not confessing. No, they cannot communicate with each other. If neither confesses, they do four years in jail. If both confess, they spend six years in jail. And if one confesses while the other's not, the confessor gets off with two years in jail while the other gets 10. According to game theory, the likely strategy of prisoners is to be, what is this, guys? Prisoner's dilemma. Prisoner's dilemma. Let's just go ahead to make sure you guys are all following along because, uh, well, what do you need to solve this thing? The box. Yeah, you go ahead and draw your payoff matrix. The box. The box. So we have prisoner A and prisoner B. This will be confess. This will be silent. Confess, silent. And then we go ahead and start filling it in. All right, so if prisoner A confesses, so if they both confess, they get six, they get six years. And if one remains silent, then they'll get 10. Oof. So clearly this is a cost of payoff matrix, so low numbers are good. So right now we know B will do, will confess if A confesses. But if A remains silent and B confesses, mm -hmm. then, wait. Wait, so if they both confess. Oh, that would be, what, what did they say, two years? Two, yeah. 
And if they both remain silent, it's four years. So does B have a dominant strategy? Yes. All right, let's go ahead to the next one. A strategy, so if B confesses and A confesses, that'll be six. But if B confesses A remains silent, that'll be 10. So there we go there. And if B remains silent and A confesses, it'll be two years and four years. So, so A is a dominant strategy and we have a Nash equilibrium right there. So the most likely strategy for the predators is they'll both confess. It's a prisoner's dilemma. It's different prisoner's numbers. Prisoner's dilemma always, they both will confess. Yeah, like, so that's why it's called the dilemma is you're, you're going to jail, you got two bad options, that's the, the least bad for you, but it also means you don't end up in the optimal solution down here. So prisoner's dilemma, it's pretty standard. Just it's a cost payoff and low numbers are good. The other, most of them are profit. Profit is good. Big numbers are good. If they, if they talk to each other, would they end up in the four then? Yeah, yeah. If they talked, they would want to say, hey, let's okay. both remain silent, but we would know they colluded. I know. Okay. I don't know. I don't know if that's illegal. In yeah. my matrix, I had the equilibrium in the bottom right. But do you have confess silent, confess silent? Or did yeah. you flip them? <laughs> uh, because you're picking big numbers instead of small numbers. So you pick 10 is better than six. Would you rather go to jail for 10? Right, this is years in jail. So that's what I was saying. This is a cost payoff matrix, low numbers. Like you want to spend less time in jail than more time in jail. So you kind of flipped it. That's why it's important to kind of read the context. Most of the time they say prisoner's dilemma if it's a cost dilemma. Okay. All right. 28. Um, 30, we can do this really, really quick. Situation a player has an incentive to cheat regardless of what the other player does and in which if both players act in this manner, both players will be worse off. It's referred to as this really should be like tit for tat strategy. It's not describing tit for tat very well. I know the correct answer is prisoner's dilemma. So guess what I can tell you about this question right out of hand. It's not gonna be on the quiz. So if you're stuck on this one, you have my permission to move on. All right, 38. 38, another question that won't be on the quiz. Just so you know, concentration ratios, and, and the book says literally nothing about it, which Big thumbs down for the book to have a question on something that they ignore. A concentration ratio for an oligopoly is if you take the oligopolists, put their market share together, it should be over 60% to be an oligopoly. So in this question, 10% would be far too little market share. So would 20, 30, even 50. It's got to be above 60. So what's the only right answer? Echo. Echo. Wait, so can you... Repeat that again. I didn't really understand. A concentration ratio is how much market share your oligopolis have. They need to have at least 60% of the market to be an oligopoly. Oh. So the CR ratio for the four needs to be above 60%. 90% is above 60%. That's it. That's how it works. I will not ask you that question. Your unit exam will not ask you that question. And I'm pretty certain I can say the college board won't either. So we can move on. Don't get stuck on this question. Just ignore it and say it won't be on the exam. All right, 41. Mm, you guys really pulling out the stops and all the not great questions. Well, so, you, we asked well I'm glad you guys ask because I'd rather like make sure we've covered it and that you know and aren't like, man, this is just, it's undoable or I'm going to fail. No, no, don't spend time on it. Let's cover this. Uh, Jake and Zoe are the only producers of slushies in Vodka Town. Every week, each firm decides whether to price high or price low for the following week. The figure shows profit per week earned by two firms. Suppose two firms decide to price high initially and adopt a tit for tat strategy in the following weeks. Over the long run, how much profit would each firm make per week? So let's just go ahead and solve this. If we are Zoe and Jake sets a high price, we want to have a low price. And if Jake goes ahead and sets a low price, we well, want to do a low price. So On the other hand, What's that? So, they have, so he has a dominant strategy of low prices. 
On the other hand, if we're Jake and Zoe sets a high price, we want to have a low price. And Zoe sets a low price, we also want to have a low price. So our Nash equilibrium will be right here. But what is our profit maximizing equilibrium? That's going to be up here at 1,000, 1,000. So there's 800, 800, 1,000, 1,000. So they say they both say set a high price, but Zoe and Jake will want to cheat. So Zoe cheats, sets a low price, makes 1,500 per week. Jake only gets 200. So then Jake will return the favor and cheat, and they end up at the Nash equilibrium. And that cycle would Repeat. essentially continue because then they go, hey, let's collude again. This says, over the long run, how much profit would each firm make per week? I really don't like this because I think they want you to go with B, right? Yes. No. Yeah. So I don't like this because it, it implies this notion that in the long run, they'll figure it out and just stick to their guns and go, we should just stop cheating. However, they would want to cheat and it would kind of cycle them through. So in the long run, you can make a convincing argument saying <coughs> that low and low is where they'd end up because they keep competing and keep cheating in the tit for tat strategy. Or they announce their tit for tat strategy saying, look, if you cheat, I'll cheat and we'll end up down here. So you know that if you cheat, you don't get the big profits the next time around. There's a lot of objections that I have to this question about how, wait, they could totally end up here and I could make a really good case for it. So how would they end up here in the long run, which is why you will not see this on the quiz or game exam. And then they wouldn't also you know, end up over there because you can't really collude because of antitrust, right? Uh, you could make the argument, but this is actually saying in the long run, you could end up here. And they're not saying that antitrust laws even exist. So not necessarily, a great argument, but there's a lot of bad arguments, which means if you're stuck, move on. Just you can know that in the long run, if there is collusion and a tit for tat strategy, they should keep colluding in the long run. If you got that, you know enough and you won't see this on the quiz. If they collude, don't they always come back to where they start? Well, right, they collude, they come here, but then they come back here. And if we kept doing this and losing and losing and losing, come back here. The argument is we would just, if we're rational, eventually just say, look, let's stop yeah. and just stay here. But also you could make a pretty good argument that we have no trust because we'll always want to cheat and always just end up here and say, no, I'm not going to do that again. Again, which is why this question, I don't like it. It's far too argumentative. You won't see it. Okay. All right. And the last one. Mm. Oh, last two. Sorry. 43. All right, another kind of side by side. So let's go ahead and solve it. They're trying to add a receivable. Should they advertise or not? They show the payoff matrix each firm we receive in the advertising decision. Profits each sell in the payoff matrix are Coke Pepsi. Yep, Coke Pepsi, they tell you. So there's no Coke Pepsi. All right, and we will be Pepsi first. So we go ahead and look at this and let's solve this. If Coke advertises, what should Pepsi do? Remember, if you want to draw your lines, go ahead and draw that line and divide them up, but don't do it on the test, do it on your own paper. Okay, so if Coke advertises, what should Pepsi do? No advertise. Advertise. If Coke does not advertise, what should Pepsi do? Advertise. So Pepsi has a dominant strategy. On the other hand, if Pepsi advertises, what should Coke do? 800, 650, they should advertise. What happens if Pepsi does not advertise? 1500, 1000. So Coke has a dominant strategy. And we have a Nash equilibrium right here. Advertise, advertise. However, we also have the profit maximizing one here. So let's see. In each cell, the payoff major is Coke Pepsi. If both firms expect to play this game every year for the foreseeable future, what outcome might result from tacit collusion? So if they're colluding, they can end up where? Away from the Nash equilibrium 
and go to the profit maximizing outcome or the cooperative equilibrium. Does that make sense to you guys? So if they collude and they know this is our data, they end up here. So they will both not advertise and neither firm advertises during the Super Bowl. C is the answer. Yep. So does profit maximizing mean um, cooperative? Yes. So be, wait, so the only reason why they go to C or the answer choice C yep. is that for more profit? Right, because they're colluding. I know it's tacit colluding, they're still colluding. Hey, would you rather make $800 or 1000 or would you rather make 700 or 800? 800. Well, there you go. So we both would have an incentive to collude and have no ads. How do they like know to collude if it's tacit? So tacit is an implied collusion. Now, it doesn't ask what kind of tacit collusion, just as they are. So that's collusion, and that's all you need to know. Just, just make it simple. How do they know? We assume perfect information. Both firms know all the data about each other and both know they know each other. So you would know all Coke stuff. I would know all Pepsi stuff. And we, if we can find a way to kind of like nod and wink and not advertise the best. Right? And the actual last one, which is 45, not a great one. Which of all industries would you expect more non-price competition, such as product differentiation? So, non-price competition, product differentiation, change the product, advertising, my product's awesome, that's the loser's product, buy mine, not theirs. Those are non-price competition. But product differentiation is too, make it different. If you notice when you go down a cereal aisle, most of the cereals are priced about the same. So how do I get you buy more of mine than theirs? Well, not ads, they say product differentiation. Yeah, pretty colors. So look, mine has eight colors in this bowl. Well, mine has more marshmallows. Well, mine has more crunch berries. Well, mine turns your milk into chocolate milk if you eat it. They're differentiating the product to make more competition. Wait, so are ads considered price different? Uh, okay. No, it's not differentiating the product. It's non ads are non-price competition, but they're not product differentiation. You didn't change the product. Okay, so guys, yes? On 40, it says, like, one of the choices is also about non-price competition is actively encouraging the sale. What is that? Like, All right, so which of five is not like the sale of certification in non-price competition? Like, I just didn't know between A and E. It's supposed to be E, but... Well, then Okay. Oh, okay. Good. So actively encourage sell generic as opposed to brand name products. Um, who like advertises, yourself, but who advertises generics? No, like the generic brands. Really? Name a generic brand that advertises. Walmart. Does, it, does, does Great Value really advertise much? You see it on their, um, on their Walmart commercials. The, the, the other thing not, is, then it's a name brand. Generic is not a name brand. They don't advertise. They just go, but we're cheaper. Okay. So generics don't advertise. Brand names do. Okay. So it's a little backwards. Advertising, yes. And product differentiation are two examples of non-price competition. Okay. By like That is a textbook definition. All right? So that's it. Good luck tomorrow, guys. Read your questions carefully. Maybe have your PPS. And uh, look forward to getting swifty.